Hello, my name is Cal Moliné from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And coincidentally, I'm Rachel Renner, <laughs> also of Richmond, Virginia, and also an anarchist. And today we're bringing to you the news from Underground. But instead of covering a uh, news segment, we're going to cover a particular question that was asked by a good friend of mine from California, asking, Cal, lately, I've been giving some thought to the philosophy of eating meat, animal rights, and pet ownership. I thought you and your friends might be interested, so here I am. I know there are all kinds of emotional landmines surrounding this issue, so I don't want to start a vegetarian versus a paleo debate, but rather rationally examine the parallels between the treatment of animals and that of children. What mm, do you think? Equally delicious. <laughs> so I guess uh, we'll start off with um, examining property rights. Um, and again, the only reason property rights exist is to resolve the ethical dilemma of uh, ownership claims and which is simply defer to the individual that homesteads said property or scarce resource first. Um, and of course, the other way of course to acquire property is to voluntary trade. But uh, in regards to self-ownership, you know, I'm the first person to occupy this body, so therefore I make a claim that this is my body. You know, it's also my lips, my, my lungs, my vocal cords that I'm, that's being used to produce these vibrations of sound to communicate to you. Um, you know, it's my, my fingers, my hands that I use to type some of these notes down. Um, so I guess different so ways to... <laughs> but at the same time, there's no such thing you can't, there's no property right molecule, there's no property right um, atom. Uh, these things don't really exist. These are just uh, conceptual concepts that uh, seem rational and consistent in which um, I guess many people who would uh, like to resolve, I guess, prevent disputes and uh, that kind of conflict would come to, right? Yeah, if you want to get more cosmic about it, you know, our molecules are constantly being slothed and sent back and we're ingesting new stuff. So, you know, how much of this matter is actually ours for whatever length of time and we'll return to the dust, etc. So, yeah, yeah. that's the... So, it's degree you can take. It. Uh, there's also another interesting idea. I have um, I guess uh, we've probably seen one um, the past spreading anarchy videos. Ty he has this also interesting introduction of uh, duty versus rights. Uh, so I think I'll have him on the show soon to talk further about that subject. Um, so in regards to property rights, uh, what about animal rights? Uh, so I guess the first thing we'd like to see if like, can they acknowledge um, their own consciousness, right? I guess that some of the I guess we'll call it the. Uh, um, the areas of which, uh, like, how do you know if you're more agent? Do you have the characteristics, uh, law of identity? Uh, can animals match up to that and also provide the same kind of uh, characteristics that human beings can in uh, respecting property rights? Uh, Self-acknowledgement, acknowledgement of others, respect for other people's property rights. Um, although I wouldn't say that necessarily has to be a qualifier. Uh, you know, there are people like sometimes children uh, find it difficult to... Uh, respect property rights in the beginning. You know, these are social norms that are being taught. Um, at the same time, you know, when you grow old and, you know, uh, Alzheimer's sets in, it becomes difficult sometimes to discern, uh, I guess, the property rights and uh, the bubble spaces of others. And so people may ask the question, well, I guess, are they more agents then? Do they not, uh, can they ever, can they claim property rights? You know, what about someone who's uh, mentally challenged and uh, find it, finds it difficult to um, to communicate that, to assert that? You know, so does that mean that they can't own their own bodies? They can't own property? Uh, so there's some interesting uh, challenges to go with, uh, I guess, talking about property rights. But I guess for me, I mean, I would say at the end of all this, regardless, I guess you could pretty much resolve all this stuff by simply saying that whatever your ethics and stances are, they're all going to be resolved by the polycentric legal system that you as ascribe to. Um, you know, if you're a Buddhist and you believe that uh, every little thing, living thing has a consciousness and has a, a right to life, you can live within that community and within the subscribe uh, rules that you consent to. And if you kill a particular life or take away life, um, here's the consequences thereof. You know, you volunteer agree to that, you consent to that, and you'll just have a lot of interesting varieties of polycentric legal rulings to those particular communities that, um, you know, the one to believe, for example, that animals, um, to value animals over human beings, um, you know, to, which I would find to be uh, what already kind of exists today. <laughs> um, well, and so much in like the state doesn't really value you as a human being or the environment. You know, they value you as uh, how much you can produce for them to steal. Um, so I guess before we talk about animal rights and all this stuff, I guess let's talk about our past history and what our thoughts are, I guess, in terms of our own uh, familiars. <laughs> okay. Well, um, an interesting thing, like, you know, one of those annoying why questions I would often pose to my mother because we, we constantly had cats was, you know, like, does the cat know I exist? How much can the cat feel? How much does the cat know? And her catch-all for it was, 
they know as much as a cat needs to know, you know, or more specifically, she'd always refer to the cat by its name because, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, every cat is different. And, you know, every cat has their own level of, you know, intelligence and, yeah, cats um, are capable of deviousness and so are goats, you know. My, my parents' litmus test for, you know, whether an animal was, you know, worthy of being domesticated was, can it, do you have to kind of outsmart it from time to time? So we were definitely more cat people and for a time goat people. So, yeah, um, I guess that would be sort of the consciousness level they deemed worthy of domestic respect. Yeah. <laughs> And some dogs have been devious, but not so much. No and I would say my connection, I guess, growing up, I felt more impartial to uh, animals. I had a wolf dog once, and so I felt a lot closer to him than I did with other people. I guess I took the George R. O'Keefe stance and, um, I guess, um, valuing uh, that animal than other human beings. Only, I guess, in so much that the human beings that I was surrounded me in my childhood didn't really value me as much. So it was very easy to kind of, you know, and devalue them as well um, and not want uh, anything to do with them. So you can have your George R. O'Keefe compounds uh, <laughs> in the same way that she had in uh, New Mexico um, and was very uh, misanthropic and just hated people. You know, that's why. And a lot of people along that mindset, they love animals a lot more because animals aren't dependent on our language. And as you know, we've discussed many times in here, linguistics and wordage are often tools for the state to be divisive for people. They're like, that word should be banned or, you know, that word is a catalyst for, you know, racial conflict or financial, you know, socioeconomic conflicts. So, you know, mm -hmm. animals, they cut through right to the heart of the interaction, you know. Are you benefiting me or are you harming me? And, you know, you can't argue your way out of it. <laughs> right. And I would say, like, in sense of emotions, you know, they do uh, create the same kind of uh, chemical reactions against the chemical chemistry that we kind of produce you know, the areas that create joy and reward. Um, although, I guess you could say, you know, our animals more so dictated by their uh, senses, by that kind of uh, na nature. Um, then they have much control over their, their own consciousness to, you know, derive decisions and options and foresee the future that many animals can. Um, I guess in, limited in that capacity. And uh, especially like when threatened with death or um, torture. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, I guess elephants do feel, I guess, I guess there's a, a, a line you don't want to kind of go over into anthropomorphizing uh, the way that animals respond to their environment in the same way that human beings respond. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a cat here <laughs> sleeping. His the name, here has <laughs> <own> free will. <laughs> his name is Bacchus, and uh, he finds it very difficult to respect uh, my property rights. Uh, you know, I have some uh, little bite marks and scratches on my arms to show that proof of that. Um, but again, I guess this goes back to moral agency, and uh, I don't believe it does, doesn't really have to. I guess I find it difficult to, to see that you can only uh, have self-ownership if you're a moral agent. Um, I think uh, every human being is morally responsible for their actions, even if you're a child, even if you're a baby, and even if uh, you're mentally challenged or you can't talk or you're deaf or mute. Uh, I think in so much that it doesn't really matter uh, whether you believe that people can have more agency or not because again it goes down to the victim of said uh, offense that was taken against them you know the, the initiation of that aggression you know of course if a baby accidentally you know kicks me or something like that I'm not going to sue that child or sue the parents I'm going to look at the situation soberly and say hey, it's, it's a child just exploring and discovering this world and if I may add to the situation Bacchus you know his threshold for scratching and biting is dependent on him having a coat of fur which you don't so he might have misjudged yeah, his ability yeah. to. And he doesn't yeah, really bite. He plays. To draw from. Yeah, he's, he's, he's exploring this heart. world. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> so I don't, uh, I don't beat my cat when he's uh, scratching a little bit or nibbling away. I don't, uh, um, I guess, find, uh, you know, take away his toys, you know. Um, I guess he, he views me, I guess, and not so much that he probably feels that he's my ownership, my owner. Um, but I guess in the same way of uh, many pets, um, I guess we'll, we'll go to the pet ownership stuff like that in a while, in a second. I guess I just wanted to make sure we cover over the animal mm -hmm. rights. But I guess in the same way that um, most of our ethics are going to be dictated by the polycentric legal system that we subscribe to, um, that kind of resolves many, I guess, the variety of different viewpoints. You know, I guess in a, in a free and voluntary society, you're going to have a rich, diverse communities out there that caters to a lot of different preferences and a lot of different lifestyle and choices. And, and it would behoove us to understand animal behavior if we want to effectively punish slash manage them, you know, I mean, Jane Goodall didn't go in there and, you know, put the chimps in pants. No, she took the time to understand how their hierarchy worked and that's how she was able to mesh herself into them. Yeah, yeah. So I guess in terms of animal rights, um, 
regardless of the polycentric legal system, you know, can, can the animal respect your rights? <laughs> um, you know, can you negotiate with the uh, anaconda not to continue to wrap itself around you and, you know, crushing the, you know, the, the, the breath out of your life? Um, can you negotiate with, uh, I, I guess, with, with many of these animals, I guess, in, in terms of that? Um, yeah, apex predators, that's an interesting thing because nobody thinks of it. Like, I'm going to go beat the shark. Oh, no, we got to find a way to trick the shark because we're not going to outmatch that. Right. <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't be so much worried about uh, animal attacks. It's interesting that, like, it's, uh, hippos are uh, number one creature, I guess, in, uh, in Africa that kills a lot of human beings. But, of course, people think of, uh, in terms like, well, you're most likely to be killed by lightning or by sharks or by these other particular animals. No, you're most likely to be killed by your own government. Uh, <laughs> actually, I guess it's... Uh, you're more like by by especially by the police agencies. You're I guess uh, eight times more likely I guess uh, than to be uh, murdered by uh, police extortionists from the United States government than you are by terrorists. So it's uh, you know we're concerned about the um, property rights and the degree in which we treat each other. You know let's let's end that biggest threat to all life. You know that is the state. Um, so let's go into eating animals. Uh, I guess what, so, recently <laughs> so I guess what would you say your uh, preferences are in uh, eating? Um, at the moment, I try to consume um, cage-free, free-range meat. Um, I tried to be vegetarian for about five years. Uh, kind of shifted into pescatarianism, and now I'm, you know, on ethical animals. And I'm always about quality of life. You know, if I'm going to type back into my domestic pet ownership, you know, I I let my cats go outside. They might not live as long, but they will live a happier life. Um, but they still come home. Yeah, right? they they still come home, and I think they're happier and more well-adjusted for it. You know, and I I appreciate they do come home you know right. maybe it's because i'm a food bringer or maybe because i'm actually part of their you know family unit and community I so i guess in a way you can't say you can't really owe them because it's not like you're keeping them and constrained in a an environment where mm -hmm. they can't escape they, they have the freedom to leave and they can wander off if they wanted to but they mm -hmm. still view this this as their home um, yeah and i would in some ways allow animals i intended to eat to do that too you know i mean i don't intend to eat my cats they fulfill other needs for me sort of a child surrogate slash i'm hoping vermin control sort of thing but uh yeah yeah i i can recognize misery in another creature you know as a conscientious human being i can certainly allow myself that and much of when I came to nonviolent anarchism, I'm tired of apologizing for being a good human being, you know, for being somebody who's empathetic. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I I would rather not have an animal that's up to its own knees and feces and in the darkness for most of its life for dinner. I mean, that's, that just doesn't appeal to me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> And uh, most of those cases in those kind of factory farming situations are a result of, uh, you know, state-backed uh, subsidies, uh, state-backed corporations like uh, Monsanto, for example, with their IP trolling and, uh, and patents. Um, and so a lot of these things, I guess, in, in that context of um, the way corporatism works, you know, wouldn't exist. And not to the degree in which uh, it does today, which they are not liable for their own actions, you know, um, and for the, for the, I guess, the destruction that they cause. Um, Especially in terms of property rights and the uh, runoffs that they create, um, you know, they can't you can't hold the CEOs liable for the decisions that they make, uh, for ruining the environment, for for decimating, uh, I guess, many of the the livestock that they that result to that. And many times it's a band aid job that's given to farms that have otherwise gone under. Okay, oh, you don't have work anymore. Here's three sheds full of chickens. You know, yeah. you're now work for Tyson. Congratulations. Yeah, and don't forget for the most part, uh, <laughs> a lot of meat is subsidized, so it wouldn't be readily available. They wouldn't have so much of these these cows and a lot of these. Uh, animals out there for, I guess, for, for in those meat factories, uh, if government weren't subsidizing that kind of artificial inflation of a demand. Uh, so you'd find um, there's no such case, you know, people would be eating less meat because it'd be a lot more costly to, to continue to consume it in the, in the, at the rate that it is uh, eating today. Um, and of course, when you look at well, what about organic foods? Well, organic foods cost a lot because of the state regulations and state interventions that uh, push a lot of the uh, I guess inspections on those particular products and which is they have to offset the cost somehow. So in actuality, they'd be a lot cheaper than they were today. A lot of the uh, additional costs added onto that is because of the state. And so, you know, you find uh, without the state far removed, you know, there'd be uh, less uh, meat availability uh, to consume, you know, which is healthy. And all at the same time, a lot more healthier foods at a much lower and uh, healthier price. And some of the peripheral costs of factory farming, you know, growing up in the wetlands, you know, the nitrogen runoff, algae blooms, you know, just seepage. 
fishermen losing their livelihood, you know, people who catch in the wild and don't have to worry about, you know, factory farming and whatnot. They're the fish kills that result from pig farms. Yeah. I've seen a bunch of excess shit to run into the bay, you know, grrr. Me, I'll pre minutes. pretty much eat anything. Anything that flies, swims, slither, croaks, jumps, um, <laughs> moves, runs, uh, shouts, uh, shouts. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, like, I, I would imagine years. that, um, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the entire circle of life thing, you know, there, I have microbes eating away at me, I have bacteria eating away with me, and I'm e also eating bacteria. And oh, and some of them happily so, and, you know. I yeah, and those are animals too, they also have animal cells. Um, so there are, uh, I guess that's just the nature of the, the world, you know, we're constantly consuming each other, that the energy is transferring from one state to another. Um, and so it's, it's not, you're not really uh, destroying matter, you can't destroy matter. Uh, it, it can only be divisible, but it can't uh, be uh, destroyed in, in that sense. It only can be transferred or changed to another form. Mm. And so, you know, they'll say actually, I guess the carbon atoms in your own body, I guess the last, it's been used by other animals in the last, uh, I guess, eight times before your life. So, and yeah, just got cosmic. <laughs> um, so I, I guess in that sense, I, I don't really have, I guess for the most part, it can, it's um, something that find, a lot of people find it difficult to do because of uh, the way that the, the state is so heavily involved in the food industry and the health industry. And so it's not so much that uh, people can't eat healthy, they, sometimes they can't, you know, in, in terms of the ways that they raise the cost of organic food and subsidize uh, the, the shitty food. And so sometimes it's, you know, at a necessity, they have to go to the dollar menu. Um, and a lot of lifestyle choices that just weren't taught to them are how to eat healthy and how to uh, prepare themselves for that, you know, things that they don't teach you in public school settings, right? Uh, they need you to become, uh, make poor lifestyle choices to become dependent on the government, on their Medicaid, on their Medicare, and now Obama's uh, death care. So um, being independent and healthy and uh, rejuvenated and uh, having a long, fulfilling life is the last thing that government wants you to have. Um, you know, this they, they set everything up against that. So in return to, um, I guess we could talk about ethical farming, but we just covered that. You know, there'd be no Monsanto, there'd be none of the, um, I guess some interesting farms I visited, uh, Polyface Farms in Shenandoah Valley was, uh, I love that place. That place is very well, has a is very empathetic uh, feel to the way of their treatments to animals. You know, there's um, the grazing fields that they have, the open environment for, for their chickens, for their pigs, uh, for, for their cows, uh, for, for like pretty much every little living organism on that um, particular area that Joel Salatin has. It's, uh, I don't know, it's like uh, nature's paradise <laughs> uh, for, for all the animals there. Uh, they're well fed, they're well kept. Uh, there's a lot of tender, loving care that goes into that. And of course, if you read like one of his books, like everything that I want to do is illegal, um, you know, he finds them pretty much as the government that interferes in his way of life and providing them a better health care uh, and treatment of animals, the FDA especially. Um, so again, it's the result of most of the human misery, animal misery is the state. You are what you eat, so don't be a government raised asshole. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about, I guess, um, in a free voluntary society and a lot of uh, endangered species, endangered animals, you've, you'll find that, uh, you know, anarcho capitalism can help uh, protect them. Uh, there are some examples, private uh, safari reserves that uh, do just that. Um, a lot of these animals were under control of government. Of course, government is very difficult to be efficient in what they do, and many of them die. So, private um, safaris is what works. And the way that that works is sometimes. Um, when like uh, you've probably have seen images online of like maybe um, someone with a rifle over like a rhino and you think oh my god you know they're uh, they're killing all these rare and exotic animals but you know it turns out you know that rhino has already uh, lived a long life is already into old age and it's uh, kind of nearing the point where it's going to die on its own soon so what they do sometimes is uh, let out very, some very very few rare licenses out there to permit a hunting of that um, already animal that's about to recede into the ground itself and the cost of that license helps to offset the cost of the entire compound you know uh, that animal itself has produced many offspring uh, helps continues to protect and raise the population of these uh, endangered species and so you find a lot of uh, I mean that's, that's what happens when you have a uh, private ownership you know you take good care of, of your environment
Uh, Unfortunately, in a lot of cases you hear about when people own exotic animals, it's to the point where they've become like, you know, Branch Davidian-esque, like you know, the guy who has five tigers under bad conditions, yeah. and he's more keeping them because it's, I don't want the government to take away my big cats, you know, when they're trying to take my big cats away from me and all that. Or say SeaWorld recently and all this contention. Well, it's quite obvious that the animals you're keeping are, you know, going crazy and eating people. So, you know, maybe you need to rethink your business plan. It's like, no, they're trying to take it away from us by force, so we're going to clean. You know, yeah, I'm not really or throw fun. money yeah. at it because that's what the government wants. They want money. They don't want the welfare of the animals. Yeah, I'm not particular fun of zoos myself either. Um, but I guess you can look at um, I guess I guess going back to the meat area of like eating meat. You know, if you have removed government, you free up all of the uh, I guess creative innovations and sciences that can kind of unleash into maybe perhaps uh, creating artificial meat. I uh, remember reading uh, several articles from Japan a few years ago oh, and how yes. they created the meat. Yeah, so <laughs> they've made meat out of uh, sanitary uh, refuse. And so, I guess, aka uh, feces, aka um, byproducts of uh, human uh, excrements. And so, but apparently, it's uh, of Very course. Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but it works and it's, uh, it's, it has the same uh, chemical characteristics, um, healthy to eat. Uh, still expensive, of course, as are most new products that come out of you know these particular sciences and fields. But of course, over time, you market it and you have a lot of capitalism and competition. These things get cheaper, and, and the quality continues to improve. So you know, alternatives can arise from that. You know, when you end the intellectual property of uh, these monopoly license of patterns of ideas that uh, restricts other people from um, from creating, from delving more into that science. Um, so of course, intellectual property isn't property, right? In regards to the realms of property rights, it doesn't exist. Uh, you can't uh, um, restrict another person's use of their own resources because they see you doing the same thing. They would like to also copy and mimic and uh, perhaps improve upon um, your idea. Well, I guess the idea is out there now. It's not scarce. Um, and you can't really point to an idea. There's no molecule or atom of an idea. Um, so yeah, so you have a lot of interesting ways for science to lead the way in finding maybe perhaps one day alternative ways is that we can, um, I guess, further let go maybe one day of eating meat altogether and just create new synthetic forms of meat. I guess kind of matrixy like, you know. Uh, what was it that they ate in the matrix? Something that was like tasty wheat. It was tasty wheat. Some... <laughs> no, you're eating tasty wheat. <laughs> That's all the some vitamins and amino, amino acids that your body yeah. needs. It doesn't have everything the body needs. Um, and Japan is kind of leading the way with that too, with a lot of their sex bots coming out online. Mm, be like, you know, Willy Wonka. Like, this is the, you know, experience of a steak. Yeah. 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 Um, so you, you, there's a lot of stuff that, that I guess the potential markets that could, could arise from this. Um, and maybe that, you know, I find that to be a lot more worthwhile myself too. You know, I would also like to lessen the harm in, um, of other animals' lives too as well in, in my environments. But again, the first focus I think it should be is to less end the harm that we do to each other first as human beings, and especially that's done to children. Um, but I guess before we go to children, let's talk about, I guess we did talk about pet ownership. Um, and I guess uh, you have a note as uh, pets as a child surrogate, surrogates? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, so. The pill plus cats, you know, and that's how I contribute to population control, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I was going to have real children, I wouldn't want to keep them in perpetual, you know, cat-like states. You know, I'd have to realize at some point they would, they would need to, as it were, turn against me and become themselves and move out and all that. But as it is, you know, cats, their, their dependency is what I need right now to, you know, keep the baby rabies away. I keep their actual rabies away and I keep my baby rabies away. <laughs> and at the same time, you'll find the, I guess, the, the way that you treat children, you know, again, going back to ending the harm, the initiation of force we do to each other, that also involves children. Um, now, unless you want to raise a sociopath that's a, a future would-be sociopath that's already harming and killing a lot of cats. Um, you know, every once in a while on the news, you'll find that, like, uh, like, I think last time was in Florida, of a number of different cats in this particular neighborhood that were found murdered and killed. And then they found that the child that was doing that. Um, and of course, you retrace like the background of that child, you know, pretty much it's always the case. There's, there's abusive parents, abusive upbringing, very stressful environment, a um, lot of uh, harmful and physical abuse involved in there. And I mean, don't forget that for the most part, you know, it's basically spanking and hitting a child, you know, knocks out a cue points, so it makes it difficult to, to rationalize. Um, you know, and at the same time, you know, hitting your child and using that aggressive force is not empathizing with your child. So what makes you think that the child's going to grow up, much less to empathize with uh, other animals. 
um, you know, and that's pretty much a, that's what kind of lacks in these kind of environments: empathy, that kind of connection, um, that understanding. The um, you know the way you treat your child is how they're going to treat the rest of their environment. Um, they're going to use that as a way to project themselves as a as an outlet. Yeah, and, somewhere along the line, that child is receiving a very clear indicator of you know not oh it screams I need to be more gentle oh it screams I need to hit it until it stops screaming right. Um, <laughs> No, they're yeah, just repeating the those social gentle, norms. Gentle, gentle. Any good parent I know, when their kid approaches a pet, you know, they're, they're telling them to you know, regulate it, look at the animal's indicators, you know, be empathetic to its signals, and then you won't get bit or scratched. Yeah. And I guess in returns to, um, I guess, the treatment of children, I mean, that's the same way. I mean, of course, you want to um, value human beings more so than any other animal or creature on, on this planet. Um, they're not so much for, for the potential argument that they can grow up into be adult more agents, but, you know, that removed again, uh, I personally view that every single human being is responsible for their actions. This de determines on, I guess, if they do aggress against someone else, they do initiate force on, to someone else, like, Someone has Alzheimer's and actually, you know, bumps shoulders with me, and you know, I, I can understand and empathize where he's coming from. I am not going to sue. I am not going to seek retribution, revenge. I'm not going to take him to the legal system. I'm going to recognize the situation in that context and not be an asshole about it, and see if he needs help. Um, you know, it's uh, same thing with the child. Uh, you know, I, I, so I absolve them of that moral responsibility. I, I say that uh, you know, you know, they're still developing, they're still learning. Um, they have uh, the capacity, sir. But at the same time, I, I believe that every human being is morally responsible, and it just really depends not on everyone else in the society, right? In the same way of um, crimes that are committed, you know, people who are not involved uh, don't really have much of a say. And the only people who have a say are, are the victims themselves you know so within those two parties not not strangers that have never been involved and so i find with a more empathetic society that kind of grows uh you can remove the whole thing about well are they more agents what about someone who's old and remove the argument whether or not you know is it perfectly okay then to eat babies because they can't uh, recognize your you as an adult you as your personal property you know like animals can't um, this is your reparation <laughs> right yeah so, so you'll find some interesting <laughs> arguments out there that say like well uh, you can definitely eat babies until uh, children until the age of 10 because they can't respect their property rights and you can also eat the mentally ill and it's like well if you're going to go in terms of that sure I can understand the uh, the area where you're trying to define them as they're not more agents but I'd rather say every human being is uh, morally responsible and I'd, I say that it's up to the victim you know um, to have a say so in regards to how far they want to push it. and of course if someone's going to want to push it to the legal extreme of a child who accidentally you know uh, has this little toy and actually hits him on the knee um, you know that shows as a society what an asshole you are um, but of course um, hopefully assholes you know would be among other similar assholes like George O'Keefe you know likes to be an asshole to herself and uh, so I'd figure there's, there's a lot of well and in terms of the, the way that she sees other people as assholes and doesn't want anything to do with them so they, they live in the kind of lifestone community yeah, she they want was to totally in. without merit nobody would buy her nectates so. yeah and she wouldn't care for that she wouldn't involve herself around you know uh, such creatures as she would call them um, I love her artwork by the way uh, it's very organic even when she draws houses and stuff like that she kind of devoids them of human touch makes them like they're part of nature part of the earth um, too watercolory for the most part yeah know, for my taste <laughs> like thick oily canvases yeah but I, I guess, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll find all these communities that cater to the lifestyle preferences and assholes will be among assholes and people who have empathy will be among people who have empathy. Um, I certainly would have wanted to live in a neighborhood of, of assholes. So, uh, and I, again, that's uh, what a rich, free and diverse society could, could bring. And so with that could also bring a lot of different ways to look at animals. If you want to live in an animal where you worship cats above human beings, that sounds awesome. That sounds kinky. I'd like to visit. Um, certainly want to, want to live there. But, uh, you know, hey, uh, a lot of people identify themselves more animal than they do humans. So, whatever. Well, in the desert. So it's yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so with that, I guess that kind of covers uh, everything. Anything else you want to add? Oh, well, I want to go on this tangent, though. You seemed a little wary of it. Um, yeah, so, um, in regards to farming, if we're to think that, you know, we're on a tax farm and see ourselves as a parallel to animals that are on the farm, what is the, you know, anarchistic ideal for farming? Do we, like, um, just let animals roam free and shoot them when they, you know, come into our sphere of living? Like, you know, people who hunt with crossbows from their suburban windows when the deers become too populous, the people run into them with their cars? Or would you, you know, set aside wild areas that accommodate the animal life and go in there and perform, you know, like, culls every 
you know, season after birthing and what have you. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's something to consider if farming is too much of a parallel to not mesh with the, you know, anarchistic ideal. If it's a do unto everything that's capable of feeling pain as we would have do unto ourselves to just be as non-coercive as possible, you know, how do we revamp the idea of farming? So yeah, that's something to consider. And I know that's going to bring up a lot of questions of animals that can't take care of themselves, that need to be milked or to, you know, bred down to a helpless creature like most breeds of chicken to ever go feral. And, you know, also on that note, calling cops pigs, you know, that's a disservice to pigs because pigs can go feral <laughs> like that and go back again. So, you know, pigs and cats, awesome creatures as far as being able to choose to be with us or choose not to be. I saw the funniest picture once of um, there's a cop holding up a big hog in his hands <laughs> and the caption of uh, says, uh, you know, they're like, stop, what are you doing? I'm one of you. <laughs> Let me go. Only for now. <laughs> And cops will be just fine, too, if we take away the right. livelihood. And There's plenty of useful skills that go along with being a policeman that aren't directly and, and a free involved in throwing someone into a rape cage. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's fine. With that, salute. I'm high. Uh, thank you for enjoying the show. And uh, let us know, of course, if you have any uh, topic suggestions or anything you'd like for us to cover or discuss. And with that, thank you for watching. This is uh, Kyle Maloney signing off. And Rachel Renner. Ciao. See you guys at the break party. Take good care.